All right, moving on to our fourth and final video of the Sensation and Perception series, we're going to look at hearing. Audition is the fancy name for hearing. And again, it is an energy source, just like sight is, where in vision, it's light energy. In sound, obviously, it's sound waves, which is basically compressed air that we will convert into neural images. And remember, there is no sound in the real world. It's our brain that actually interprets it. The sound waves that come to us, again, the if you remember the frequency, with the frequency in sound, the wave, the, more, the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch sound. Okay, and the amp louder the amplitude, or the size of the wave, the louder the sound. Okay? So let's have a look at our ear. It's basically comprised, comprised of three parts. We've got our outer ear, our middle ear, and our inner ear. On the outer ear, it contains the auditory canal and the eardrum. So what happens, the, the big floppy part out here that we call our ears, this is the, the name for this is the pinna. And what the pinna does is collect those sound waves and it compresses it through the auditory canal until it hits the eardrum. The eardrum is right here and marks the end of the outer ear. And there's a good look at it right there. Now the eardrum is just a membrane and it vibrates. So sound waves cause the energy of that causes this to vibrate and it's connected to some bones on the other side of the eardrum which is the the anvil the hammer and the stirrup and you'll notice that one of them is connected to this fluid filled sac right here and this is the middle ear okay so from the middle ear it's going to attach into the cochlea okay the oval window is where the stirrup actually attaches to there okay and then it will cause vibrations in the cochlea which in turn, which is known as the oval window, by the way, where this connects, which in turn stimulates the flow of this fluid over top of the basilar membrane, which is the skin. If we uncoil this, it's the skin. It contains hair follicles, basically, which are the sense receptors. And this causes them to move, and then things are picked up by our auditory nerves and then sent into our auditory cortex. Okay, so here's the nerve. Here's the, the cochlea that's partially uncoiled. You can see the basilar membrane and where the sense receptors are, are there. And again, this is the oval window where the stirrup covers that and the motion of the fluid will travel around this way. Okay, and the codes then that are sent to your brain into your auditory cortex dictates the kind of sound you hear. Now, hearing loss deafness is uh, something that many people have to go through. And in fact, experts will, t will say that if you had to choose between losing your sight or losing your hearing, which would you choose? The experts say it's actually easier to lose your sight because in sight you're cut off from objects. When you lose your sense of, of sound, you're actually cut off from people. You don't hear conversations around you. So hearing loss can happen in two different ways. There's conduction hearing loss. So conduction is getting those sound waves uh, into the part of your ear that will transfer it into neural messages. So this is your eardrum and the canal. If those are damaged, you have conduction hear lossing or those bones. Okay, sensory neural hearing loss is in the cochlea and cochlear implants are used for this. A lot of people in the deaf culture are against cochlear implants because they think they're saying there's something wrong with them and it is an invasive surgery so many opt not to get that. Now the age you get a cochlear implant has a lot to do with whether it's effective or not. Um, if you get it later in life, a lot of people are very dissatisfied with it. They never learn to talk like a speaking person and they don't hear sounds quite the same way. The younger, the better. But learning sign language is just like learning any other language like English, Spanish or Italian or whatever it is. Uh, we process it the same way. We, we, it's stored the same way and we use it the same way. Okay, so it is definitely an, a language. It's just with your hands rather than using your mouth. These are the little hair cells. Now notice they're, they're very fine fibers and the compressed sound in there, uh, the, the waves will cause that to move as the, the fluid flows over the basilar membrane. Um, we are exposed to a lot of sounds and older people can't really high, hear higher frequencies and we'll demonstrate that in class. You'll be able to hear sounds that I can't hear. But this gives you an idea. This is measured in decibels. So our threshold of hearing is, is zero. 
Okay, when it goes up to 10, okay, it's 10 times that. But when it goes to 20, it's actually 100 times that. So it's like the number in front tells you how many zeros. So this is where this orange starts, this black line is. Um, this is about the sound of a busy street corner. Once we get above that sound, we're starting to do uh, damage to our ears. And many of us walk around with earbuds and we have music playing at this kind of level. And uh, we, we find that people are starting to lose those high frequencies a lot sooner in life than they did in my generation. So how do we perceive the pitch? A place theory is where uh, where the hair cells on the, on the basilar membrane are stimulated uh, will dictate whether or not we can hear that sound. And the high-pitched sounds will affect the smaller ones, and that's why we lose that during the course of our, our lives, even through normal development. The frequency zero theory uh, has to do with basically how quickly these impulses are transferred. So it's more of a speed thing as opposed to where it is stimulated. We have stereophonic hearing, stereophonic hearing, because we have two ears, so we can locate sounds. We can uh, locate locate them due to the intensity or the speed of the sound. We basically create like a sound shadow, so the sound waves are hitting one ear. In this case, this guy's right ear before his left ear, so we can tell where the sound comes from. Um, your brain is very adept at determining this, which is really important for survival. If you're out in the forest and a predator is after you, hopefully you can hear it coming so you can get out of the way. So it is a strong survival thing, and that's why we can pick it up so well. Our brain can read very small differences in how, how quickly from one ear to the other those sound waves reach. Okay, so we'll move on to some other senses now. We'll look at the sense of touch and pain as well as taste and smell. Um, touch, there is only these receptors for touch in your skin. We have, it, it is a pressure sense, okay? It's obviously not an energy, it's a pressure. Um, and we have warmth receptor, cold receptors, and pain receptors. Notice there's no receptors of hot, but it's a combination of our cold receptors and our warmth receptors. So in this diagram here, this person's holding a tube, one filled with warm water, one with cold water, and the perception perceived from that is hot. Same thing with, you know, things like itch is a combination of pain. Um, all the other senses that we have are combinations of these receptors. Pain is something we want to understand a lot about because um, pain is biological, it's psychological, and actually has so, uh, social social influences as well. Um, we have noise receptors, noise receptors in our skin that will, will pick up uh, signals that will tell our brain to release our, our pain substance, substance P, in our neurotransmitters. Um, we have a gate control theory because your nerves that travel into your spinal cord uh, go from a small fiber to a large fiber, and we believe that is a gate that we can control to, to ignore the pain. So it has to pass that gate in order for you to get the pain. Other things that help us control pain are endorphins, okay? Release of endorphins that we learned about in Unit 2, or Unit 3, I guess it was. Um, which also leads us to the idea of the psychological part. Phantom, phantom limb sensations are a real problem. These are for like amputees may have had their legs cut off and then they will actually experience itch or pain in their, in their feet even though they don't have it. Another example, this is our brain expecting things. It's not, it's not much unlike uh, you sitting in your, you feel like your cell phone has gone off, vibrated in your pocket, uh, only you find out you don't even have your cell phone in your pocket. Um, also related to tinnitus. It's like your brain is expecting some kind of uh, input that it's used to, so it creates that ringing sound. Tinnitus is that ringing in your ears. We have other ways of, of controlling it. Uh, the psychological influences are if you've been through something, you've had pain. If you've been to the dentist, you've experienced pain there, then you're likely to feel more pain when you go back there again. So our memories have something to do with it. Um, when we're thinking of pain, it makes it hurt worse too. You've probably been in situations where you've been hurt, you didn't know, then you look and you got this big bruise or a cut and you go, ouch, that hurts. And now you start to realize the pain because you think of it. The Lamaze childbirth method uh, teaches mothers that are going to have a baby to put themselves in a happy place and focus on their breathing. And so therefore, they're hoping that that will be enough to control the pain so they can have a natural child childbirth. 
So it's a biopsychosocial approach again. Okay, there's the biological influences. Have a look at those. The psychological ones, the attention, our learning based on expectations, sociocultural influences, um, the presence of others, empathy for others' pains, and cultural expectations. Cultural expectations, some cultures deal with a lot of pain. They have a higher tolerance than people from other cultures. So physical methods, obviously, we've heard of, you know, things like acupuncture and that um, rubbing a sore when you get a, a hit by a rock or something, you're going to rub the area and it helps release the endorphins. And the psychological methods are like what I've talked about, you know, looking at uh, is there um, a way to ignore that pain, a way to, to not think about it. Um, other things you might have heard of are TENS machines, which will send electrical impulses across the area, which release endorphins and cause muscle contractions, which also help. And we can control pain. There's been lots of athletes that have done some amazing things uh, with pain, and they've actually had these TENS machines attached to them while they've done it. So moving on to taste. Now, taste is a chemical sense. Taste and smell are chemical senses. Uh, we have five basic tastes. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. You may not have heard umami. It's one of the last ones kind of added to that list of four tastes. So we have five. Uh, we have taste buds. You can kind of see on your tongue the little conglomerations of them if you look really closely, and they contain the taste buds. Um, Taste, again, is a sense that will decline as you get older. You mommy, if you're wondering, it's like a, a savory flavor. It's uh, People describe it as like a fresh chicken kind of flavor that it, it detects. Smell, again, a chemical sense. So particles of an object will, oops, sorry, particles of an object will actually escape the object, enter your nostrils, and that's where you start to smell it. Okay. Um, the olfactory bulb an olfactory nerve is where we process these tastes. So here's what it looks like. It goes up into your nose. We hit the olfactory bulb, okay? And there, the messages are changed into electrical impulses and you sense your, what you smell. Where we sense our smell is actually located fairly close to where our memories are stored, processed and stored. So smell and memory are closely related. Body position and movement, we call this kinesthetic or vestibular sense. Not official senses, but they actually are senses. Uh, kinesthesis is the sense of knowing where your body is in space. So these young ladies here doing these flips are have fairly good kinesthetic intelligence because they know where their bodies are. Vestibular sense is basically where your head uh, is in space. So when you tip your head, for example, you know your head is tipped. And the way this works is in the semicircular canals, of your ear, um, we have vestibular sacs of, of the liquid, and the liquid actually moves, and your brain reads this movement. It tells you your head is tipped or if it's not. So this is why often we get motion sickness, where we get dizzy, we spin around, and the movements inside your ear don't match what you're seeing, so it causes dizziness or motion sickness. The senses interact with one another. Um, the McGurk effect is a, if we say a syllable, uh, you see someone saying a syllable, but the syllable you hear is not what the person says. It's been recorded and dubbed over top. You'll actually hear a third syllable. And I'll show you a little video of that in class. Um, they interact. Vision seems to take precedence and we depend on our vision. Um, Visual capture is the, the idea that vision takes precedence over other senses, but they do definitely work together and they interact with one another. For example, smell and taste. Smell is a large part of your taste. If we made you plug your nose and we gave you a slice of potato and a slice of apple, you probably would not be able to tell the difference because of the taste. Embodied cognition, synesthesia, how we perceive these things. There are people that have their senses are kind of mixed up a little bit. So when they say, for example, one of them might be they taste colors. So when they eat a piece of food, that flavor actually translates into a color that they see. So they'll choose their meals based on which colors go together than which flavors go together. Okay, so summarizing the senses, have a look at this chart. Um, maybe I'll, I'll print this one out for you guys and we'll give it to you. It just kind of gives the a basic of those things, but you need to know them inside and out and how we make sense of our world. Okay, so that's the end of sensation and perception. Get yourselves ready for a test. We'll see you guys in class. Bye for now.